Out of respect for the words and works of our Savior, I invite you to please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel on which we meditate this evening comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, where God's Word says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No! It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Here ends God's word. You may be seated. Your friends in Christ, grace and peace are yours in the blood of the Lamb. I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Do you realize how much of the teaching Jesus did just simply during Holy Week? It's amazing that with the constant bombardment from the, the high priests and the teachers of the law and the, the Pharisees that Jesus did not shy away. He didn't shy away from any confrontation, though the blatant disrespect was there. He didn't hide himself away to protect his own life because there were still some lost sinners who needed to hear the truth. That's where we get to our lesson this evening. Where Jesus... Steps, final steps led him to some Greeks. Some steps led to these Greeks because the Greeks came to the exact same place where Jesus and his disciples were. For it was the time of the festival. Some Greeks went up to worship at the festival. This is the Passover that, that Jesus and his disciples are getting ready to celebrate. And these Greeks came to Philip was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. These Greeks were converts to Judaism. Believers in the promised child. The Jews had a name for these types of Greeks. They were the proselytes of the gate. Given that name because there was one very specific portion of, of the temple that they were allowed to be in. It's called the courtyard of the Gentiles. We know this courtyard as the same place that Jesus twice kicked out all of the merchants and money changers. A place where the Gentiles then would be given an opportunity to meditate on God's word, to pray to the Lord, and to hear the teachings. Teachings that would have told them exactly who the Messiah was to be. Prophecies that they would have heard, like Isaiah 35. Miracles about the Messiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. And since all of Jesus' miracles were, were spreading like wildfire throughout the region, I wonder if these Greeks came expecting Jesus to be the promised one from this very prophecy. 
And so out of respect or maybe out of fear for who Jesus was, they didn't dare go directly to Jesus. Rather, they went to his disciples. And they went to Philip. This is important because it means that Philip was known. They went to Philip because, one, his name is a Greek name. So maybe there is some familiarity there. And we read that he is from Bethsaida in Galilee, a Gentile town. A place where commerce was done between mostly Gentile people. And so they came to him. That doesn't seem odd. It seems respectful. To, instead of going straight to the, the president, they, they went to the Secret Service first. But what's odd is Philip didn't go straight to Jesus. Instead, he turns to Andrew for a second opinion. And this would seem odd if it weren't for the directives that Jesus gave his disciples. Directives for his disciples during their mission trips to go only to the lost sheep of Israel, to God's chosen people only. Jesus gave this directive. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So these Gentiles came wanting to see Jesus. Philip didn't really know what to do. But yet Philip and Andrew and the other disciples certainly saw times where Jesus went and communicated with non-Jews. Or maybe they were remembering some of the teachings that Jesus had. Teachings like, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. And they thought to themselves about the woman at the well. Or the Roman centurion. What should we do? Do we, do we take the Greeks to Jesus? And instead of taking the Greeks to Jesus, instead, Philip and Andrew simply went with a request. There are some Greeks who would love to see you. And Jesus saw this as a sign that his father's plan was really coming to an end. He knew what was coming, and he saw that these final steps, that the Greeks were actually taking to Jesus, were steps to fulfill his father's plan. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is the hour that the Father had appointed before all eternity. Which then lead to the words that, that when Jesus says them, should rip at our heartstrings. Because we understand that when Jesus says his next line, he knows exactly what lay ahead. The betrayal, the flogging, the spitting, the scourging, the hatred, the hitting, the cross. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, remains only a single seed. Jesus is that kernel of wheat who went to the cross to die for the sins of the world, for the sins of, of you and me. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is the kernel of wheat who was then planted, buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And Jesus is that kernel of wheat who on Easter Sunday rose victoriously to prove to us that we have been freed from death. Jesus is the kernel of wheat whom Paul recognizes in his victory chant of 1 Corinthians 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. If it dies, it produces many seeds. And so Jesus' words explain to you and me why, why we don't have to have any fear. Because this is a gift that can never be taken away. A gift because the kernel of wheat has gone into the grave and risen. And so because this kernel of wheat has risen, so we have now had the Seeds of faith planted in our hearts. 
All because some Greeks came to see Jesus. One of the most comforting messages in the midst of Holy Week itself from an unlikely source during an unimaginable context. For Jesus knew exactly what lay ahead. The salvation for you and me, even though it meant his own demise. That's why his final steps had to lead to a location where these Greeks could approach Philip and ultimately hear Jesus' words. But there was another reason Jesus had to take these steps. It was to glorify his Father. Jesus saw how everything was going exactly according to the plan that God the Father had made. And he knew what the next steps were going to be. Can you imagine the weight that must have been on his shoulders? To know that he was going to suffer as sin itself. The sins of the entire world. For the sins of all time, from all people, the, the so-called great sins, sins like uh, adultery or serial killing, or, or even the so-called smaller sins, like, like hatred of the heart, or a little too long of a look at someone who's attractive. Jesus came to pay for the sins of the world. Shoulder the weight of sin, whether great or small, all of the guilt that we hold, all of our selfishness, for this, Jesus was going to the cross. Because of our selfishness, Jesus would be separated from his Father forever. And Jesus knew this. This is why he said, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Jesus knew what lay ahead for him, and yet instead of saying, I'm going to find another way to do it, Jesus gives the question that our sinful nature would ask. Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus took these final steps so that his Father would be glorified in heaven. And then just a few days later, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he again felt the crushing weight of everything that was happening. And as his sweat turned to drops of blood, he prayed in agony, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And just a few moments later, as, as Jesus roused his disciples from their slumber, Look, the hour has come. Jesus knew that these final steps that he took so that the Greeks might find him were the beginning of the end. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus almost did this happily. When else do you say, let's go? He knew the agony he was going to endure. And yet he, faced, he set his face to the cross. All of his steps glorifying his Father with his 100% perfect devotion to his Father's will. And what does his Father say about this? Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. But Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Such is the case when God speaks. God spoke three very specific times over his son during his ministry to acclaim that this is the one who would bring glory to his name. The first time at Jesus' baptism when when the, the Holy Spirit was descending like a dove from heaven and on Jesus to, to almost commission him into his ministry, the Father spoke from heaven, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. 
And just a few weeks before all of Holy Week happened, the second time, on the Mount of Transfiguration, as, as Jesus was changed before his disciples, his, his clothes whiter than light itself, his face shining like the sun, Moses and Elijah were there talking with him, talking with him about his departure, which was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem which was his death on the cross, Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah about the very thing that set them free from their sins. And God the Father yet again spoke his approval of his son. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now here, in the last moments of Jesus' life. The very last week that that Jesus would walk the earth, God the Father speaks again, I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. For three years, Jesus' ministry had done nothing but bring glory to the Father in heaven. And his final steps would be no different. Final steps the crucifixion and resurrection. And in a moment of self-reflection, Jesus saw what was on the horizon. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This isn't the first time that Jesus talked about being lifted up on the earth. This is the first time the disciples may have been hearing something like this, but, but three years ago, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, one of the ruling members of the Jewish council, Nicodemus, tried to figure out more about this salvation. And Jesus told him that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so too the Son of Man must be lifted up. This is that time. A time when judgment is coming on the world. A time where Jesus would would be sin for us and on the cross he would be punished with the full punishment of all the weight, of all the sin, of all the time, of all people of the world. For you and for me, Jesus would die. But more importantly, the prince of this world would be driven out. Overthrown. Satan's forces have absolutely no power because the kernel of wheat went to the ground and rose. This is why Jesus confidently tells us that these words were not not spoken for his benefit, but for ours. To see that these final steps from Jesus, they, they led to some Greeks some Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. Your friends, let us do the same as these Greeks. And during these final days of Lent, let us fix our eyes on Jesus and watch his devotion to take away every sin for you and me, setting his face towards the cross, not with hesitancy, but with urgency. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And in these last days, as we approach the cross on Good Friday, let us see his devotion for us. And let us, as the writer to the Hebrews encourages us to do, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. This never could have happened if Jesus didn't go to the grave. If he didn't go to the cross to suffer for the punishment of sin, his father wouldn't have been glorified. Sin wouldn't have been forgiven. The devil would not have been overthrown. But Jesus is faithful. And Jesus is good. And therefore, he went to the cross, went to the grave, and rose victoriously for you and me. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Amen.